Good morning. Welcome to our Faith to Faith broadcast. On behalf of New Life Worship Center, my family and I, we'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. John, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17 tell us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We pray that you have received this great gift of God, as the Apostle Paul calls it, God's unspeakable gift. As you gather around uh, with loved one and family, exchanging gifts, let the gift be a constant reminder of God's great gift to you in sending his son. Now be blessed by the word of the Lord on today. We see this truth illustrated in today's story from 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. So are you there? 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, as is, as is our custom, I'm going to ask you to read along with me the first four verses. 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, let's read together out of the King James Version, the first four verses. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazath Zontamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. They did the right thing. One of the oldest books on warfare was written by Sun Tzu. He spells his last name T-Z-U, in case you want to Google that later. It's called The Art of War. And in his 13 chapters, Sun Tzu laid down some basic principles on how to wage war. And admirals and generals, they use what he wrote even today in strategizing warfare. Among his advice were these statements. He says, all warfare is based on deception, hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder and crush him, Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. Now, those seem like common sense rules, don't they? And as I shared for centuries, generals and military leaders have studied Sun Tzu's teachings and used them for the basis of their battles and military campaigns. This is how battles are waged and how wars are won conventionally. But you know, I'm pretty sure that Sun Tzu's out of war never dealt with a battle quite like the one we're reading about today and the one that the Christian goes through. The Jews appear to be outnumbered in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, 3 to 1. And according to Sun Tzu, when you're outnumbered, you're to run away. You're to flee. But not Jehoshaphat and his army. And not we, when we're in warfare against the powers of darkness. So not only did they not run away, I'm not sure they brought much in the way of weapons. In fact, their only tactical weapons seem to be a promise from God and praise. And how many of you know that a promise from God and praise is enough? 
I said a word from God and praise is enough. You won't need to know how to do a karate chop. You won't need to know jujitsu. Or you won't need to carry a 45 or 9 millimeter. You won't need to have any bombs or missiles or silos. All you need is a word from God and praise. And you're ready to defeat the devil. Hallelujah. This is an analogy of our spiritual warfare with the powers of darkness. So the first of six PowerPoints with minor points, um, and, and um, I was trying to get quickly past the first four because the fifth one is what we really want to concentrate on, and we really didn't even get a chance to get to the sixth one. And so we probably won't today either. Anyway, the first point is the acuteness of the problem. Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, verses 2 and 3, I'll read them again. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazantama, which is in Gede. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. The situation was serious. It was severe. It was extreme. And it was critical. Have you ever been in a serious, severe, extreme, and critical situation? Lord knows I have. And I'm glad I'm not just talking about myself. But you're not the only one who has ever been through what this is, is a fiery trial. So let this message speak to you. Let it give comfort and assurance to you in your situation or just in your life, if all is well. Jehoshaphat and the people of Israel are in a fiery trial right now. Somebody's in a fiery trial right now. The same word of the Lord, which told them what to do, is the word of the Lord, which is telling us what to do now. So look at the acuteness of the problem. A of three is a huge army. Here is a confederacy of heathen nations amalgamated for the sole purpose of doing battle with Judah. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Overwhelmed with bills? Overwhelmed with work, overwhelmed with sickness, overwhelmed with children issues, overwhelmed with husband issues, overwhelmed with wife issues, just overwhelmed. And we can go on and on. That's representative of a huge army. It seemed hopeless. So the first acuteness of the problem is a huge army. B, a hidden army. Hazazan, Tama, means the wood of the palm trees. That is in Engadi. This is the meaning of the word, and it is highly likely that this huge army was camouflaged beneath this heavily forested area. Sometimes you can be pressured and can't quite put your finger on it. Why am I upset? Why am I being tempted to be depressed? Why don't I have peace? You can't seem to put your finger on it. That's a hidden army. You know what? And I thought about, man, I could write a book on this. I could write a book called The Art of spiritual warfare, just from 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. And so, be a hidden army. So, not only was the army huge, and not only was it a hidden army, but it was also a 
hostile army. See, a hostile army. This army has blood in their eyes. They will have no pity. The devil doesn't have any pity, saints. He doesn't have any love. Don't ever expect sympathy from him. He's the epitome of evil and all that is bad and wrong. So our, our spiritual adversary is mean. He's out for the kill and he has no mercy. And I know you've experienced that. You've experienced heat, pressure. It seemed like there was a force just laughing at you, making fun of your dilemma. That's the devil and demons. They're hostile. They're not going to let up and comfort you. No, they want to badger you. Hostile army. Peter says it this way about our enemy, that he goes forth as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's being merciless. All right, so... Our first point is the acuteness of the problem. The second point is the awareness of the people. This also has three minor points. A, aware of the army's activities. Verse 2 says, there cometh a great multitude against thee. The enemy will draw up the worst case scenario against you. He ensures that you know all about the bad things that are going on. He makes sure you know about it. Some things that I'm going through, I don't want to hear. I don't want to know about it. But he makes sure I know about it. Like with Job, he made sure Job knew that all his cattle was gone. So he had somebody left to go and tell him. Then he had somebody left uh, where his, in the house where his children were to tell Job, all your children gone. Don't tell me anything else. Don't tell me anything. Somebody else comes and tell them something else. So the enemy, he knows how to bring you news you don't want to hear. Some things I don't want to hear and people bring to me and tell me I would have been better off if I hadn't heard that. Ah, uh, yes. I didn't need to know that. That's aware of the enemy's activity. Be aware of their absolute inadequacy. Verse 12, uh, um, Jehoshaphat said, For we have no might against this great company, neither know we what to do. This is a good place to be, to be aware of your absolute inadequacy. Jehoshaphat and his people realized that they could not possibly stand against such a numerous army and therefore could not expect to be delivered except God intervene. If the Lord doesn't come in, then we're lost. If the Lord doesn't help us, we're finished. Has anybody ever been in that kind of situation. I wish I could put my feet up. If the Lord doesn't send the money, if the Lord doesn't heal my body, if the Lord doesn't touch her heart, if the Lord ah. Uh, I understand the absolute inadequacy of the situation. I need you, God. So, see, not only uh, are you aware of the army's activity, not only aware of their absolute inadequacy, but see, aware of the Almighty's capability. 
God, you can. Notice what he said in verse 12, the rest of it. He said, but our eyes are upon thee. He knew who to look toward. His answer wasn't in mama and them. His answer wasn't in his money. Daddy couldn't help if he tried. Jehoshaphat knew where his help came from, just like David did. David says in Psalm 121 and 1, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, made heaven and earth. I know where my help comes from. And sometimes we get our eyes on the wrong thing. We get our eyes on the resource instead of the source. Just because your job is giving you a paycheck doesn't mean that your blessings financially is coming from your job. God is blessing you. He's blessing you through your job. Don't you think that your job is your source? Your job is only your resource. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Man, I could say some things, but don't want to be too long. I could say some things about even pastoring this church. Or how, how in the formative years of this church, when we first started, some of you have heard the testimony, how uh, that, that, uh, we had about half of the church because we were just starting half of the church to leave because um, a lot of them were in the Navy. They went back to their homes. Uh, some of them uh, went to start churches. Uh, even my mother-in-law started her church. And uh, we, we just had people to be leaving. And some of them were legitimate reasons. And so these people were tithers. They sustained the church. But I didn't go to God and say, oh, Lord, what am I going to do now? All our tithers are gone. No, I just kept on praising and magnifying. Can I testify? Because they're not my source. God is my source. Somebody told me you better be careful what you preach because if you get anybody mad, they're going to stop giving. They're not my source. I don't want to make God happy. I don't want to make him mad. I'd rather make you mad than make God mad. God is my source. You can get mad and dry up and leave. God will send five people to take your place because he's my source. You got to know where your help comes from. Thank you, Jesus. You didn't call me. And that means you're not obligated to sustain me. But where God guides, he provides. What God has ordained, he will sustain. Where God leads, he feeds. If it's God's will, it's his bill. How did I get on that? You need to recognize who's your source. People will try to manipulate you and have you wrapped around their fingers like you need them. You need the Lord. That's who you need. And if they want to act the fool, God knows somebody else out there. He'll clean up an alcoholic, bring her in the church, and have her to do twice as much as what you did. Oh, glory. I'm too long, too long. Just on the second point. Mm. Let's, let's look at the third point. The third point is the accuracy of the prayer. That's, that's, that's why I don't look at people's envelopes. I don't look at offering envelopes, the tithing envelopes. I don't go through them and see who's giving what because I'm not dependent on what they're giving. I'm dependent on the Lord. My eyes aren't on those envelopes. 
my eyes are upon the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if there's somebody who's vying for a particular position, now we have to check them out to be sure that they're in right standing with God. But I'm talking about generally speaking. Hallelujah. So, so three, the accuracy of the prayer. What was the solution for such a serious situation? They handled it prayerfully. And I don't want to say too much on this point because I, as I stated earlier, January will be devoted to the subject of prayer and fasting. So we will say this about it and go on. Jehoshaphat's prayer is focused on heaven. Verse 6 says, O Lord God of our fathers, are not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And, and the Lord reminded me of that story that I was going to tell you about those people who left. We never missed the beat. We never missed the beat. When they left, others came in. And you know, there were some that came in with those same people last names. <laughs> <laughs> That's God. I said, that's God. So he focused on heaven. Then, then he focused on history. Uh, verse 7, I, let me just read verse 7. We can read verses 8 and 9 also. But verse 7 says, Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? He was calling, he was recalling uh, the past testimonies of God's faithfulness. So he focused on history. Saints, when you walk with God, the Lord will give you a testimony. We recently shared about David. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. David said, I went out there and a lion tried to eat my father's sheep. But the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion. And then a bear, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the bear. And the same God who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me out of the hands of this uncircumcised Philistine. When you walk with God, God will give you a testimony. The same God who healed me from appendicitis when I laid my hands on my side, it's the same God who will heal me now. The same God who delivered me when I needed money for my car note. It's the same God who will give me what I need now. So he recalled the formal faithfulnesses of the Lord. And that's what we need to do. Lord, you did this for me. And you're going to do this for me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he focused on the heathen. He did not pray in generalities. He specifically prayed that God would take care of his enemy. Oh, glory to God. All right, let's look at point four. And point five is what we really need to concentrate on. I just touched point four. The announcement of the prophet. God always has his man in place. He may be a Moses prepared and ready to lead God's people out of bondage. He may be a Joseph prepared and ready to sustain God's people during famine. He may be a, a Wesley, prepared by God to save Britain from the inevitable revolution. Or he may be a C.H. Mason to bring God's people in the 20th century into the fullness of the spirit. Or he may be a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to bring his people out of bondage and into the glorious liberty that God has called us. But whoever, God always has a man. And so now he has a man who is Jehaziel. I guess I have to read verse 14. I'm trying to not read too much because uh, time just goes by so quickly. Read the whole chapter when you get home. Will you do that for me? Verse 14 says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, 
a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. I got to read verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Saints, you got to remember that the battle is not yours, it's God's. When the devil is trying to get you to fall and to sin, when you stand against it, you got to know that the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. When the devil tries to get you to compromise your stand for God, you've got to know that the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. And the Lord will bring you out if you follow these principles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me read verse 17 also. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. I'm so glad that God is with me. That's all I need to know, that God is with me. No wonder Moses said, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. All I need to know is God is with me. I'll do whatever he tells me to do as long as I know he's with me. That's all I need to know. It may not be uh, the most ideal circumstances when I do it, but all I need to know is that he's with me. As long as I know that he's with me, he's going to work things out. You want God with you. Be sure God is with you. We trust that this broadcast really ministered to you on today. If you like a copy of the broadcast, you can go to our website at nlwconline.org. My wife and I would just love to have you in one of our services. You still have time, as a matter of fact, to come to our 8 o'clock service. If you can't make it to our 8 o'clock service, you can make it to our 11. And if there's no imposition after the end of the service, why don't, why don't you come up? My wife and I would just love to hug you, shake your hand, tell you personally how glad we are that you came to be with us on today. We have special Christmas services since Christmas is on a Sunday and New Year's Day on a Sunday. And by the way, also the day before New Year's, New Year's Eve will be in a special celebratory service at 930. You don't want to miss that either. Go to our website and you'll find all the uh, abbreviated times and services that we're having during this season. Until next time, come receive the word, leave and experience the difference at New Life.